Before NASA, there was NACA back in the 40s, 1940s, and 50s. It was the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics with headquarters at the Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. NACA's job was to make more efficient airplanes. It had engineers who worked to solve problems like how to break the sound barrier, what to do about the sonic boom that you created. And supporting those engineers or working as hard as they could to be those engineers were dozens of African-American women mathematicians whose contributions could have easily been lost to history except for Margot Lee Shetterly. Margot Lee Shetterly grew up in Hampton. Her father was part of the scientific community, and these women passed through her house, and they were part of her community. And in her new book about NASA's African-American human computers, as they were known, she writes, Growing up in Hampton, the face of science was brown like mine. Margot Lee Shetterly joins us today. She's the author of Hidden Figures, the American Dream, and the Untold Story of the Black Women Mathematicians Who Helped Win the Space Race. She's also founder of the Human Computer Project, which works to archive these women's stories online. Welcome to Science Friday, Margot. Hi, Ira. It's great to be here. Nice to have you. Also with us is Dr. Christine Darden, one of uh, the NASA women Margot writes about, former computer, former engineer, former director of the Office of Strategic Communications and Education at Langley. Welcome uh, welcome back, Dr. Darden. Thank you, Ira. It's good to be here. Margot, tell us what, what drew you to this story. I can easily see from the book that it was all it was family-related, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> it was, Ira. In fact, um, as I mentioned in the book, um, I knew a lot of, of the women that I wrote about in the book. But also I knew that there were black scientists and black engineers and female scientists and engineers, which is, you know, we talk about um, our perception of who can be or who is a scientist. I was really fortunate to have those role models um, growing up. So, um, and it was really, as I mentioned, um, this moment with my husband, we were home for Christmas. My dad was talking about um, a number of the women, including Katherine Johnson, um, who's, which is a name that many people know, I think, at this point, um, and her contributions to, to Langley, to NASA, to the space program. And um, he, you know, was like, wait a minute, this is this is a huge story and nobody knows about it. So for me, uh, it was something that to a certain extent I took for granted. And, and that one moment really um, sort of saw that those women and that history and how I grew up with fresh eyes. And, um, you know, once I started asking questions like, well, how did they come to Langley? Yeah. Why were there so many black women there? I, I just couldn't stop chasing the story. Well, take us back to those. Take us back to the 30s. How did NACA first begin hiring women to do math and then start hiring black women? What was the motivation there? Right. So as you mentioned earlier, um, the job of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics was to make planes faster, you know, more efficient, safer. And um, there was a lot of testing involved in that. Sometimes they did free flight testing, which was, you know, they'd attach instruments to a plane and fly the plane. Sometimes they parked the, the plane or plane parts, a wing um, or the body of a plane in a wind tunnel and blew the air over the part or over the plane to simulate flight. Um, but in either circumstance, there was so much data from the instruments that had been attached to the plane that, um, you know, all of these numbers needed to be analyzed the same way, you know, we have lots of data in, in so many different disciplines these day, days. It needs to be analyzed. It's tedious work, but it's really necessary. And the engineers were doing it. So what they decided is, what if we had a computing pool the same way we have a secretarial pool, and we'll distribute this work to the members of the pool. So in 1935, they hired five women, in this case they were white women, um, to start processing all of this data that came from, from the aeronautical testing. And it was a hit. The women were extremely good at their jobs. Um, it freed the engineers to, to do things other than the computing. Um, there was a real bonus in the fact that they, they paid the women less than they paid the men, even if they were doing very similar work. And it, it created huge efficiencies in the aeronautical research industry. And this is a time when um, airplanes are becoming, you know, more and more a part of the military. 
Um, and then on the eve of World War II, you know, obviously um, the airplane was a, a very significant weapon of war. Um, it would go on to influence the balance of, uh, of victory in World War II. Um, so the black women started coming in 1943, and this was two years after a man named A. Philip Randolph, who was a civil rights leader, um, whose name not as many people know today, but who was very well known in those days, um, really pushed Roosevelt to open the then segregated federal government, the civil service defense industry, open those jobs to African Americans. So two yeah. years after Roosevelt signed an executive order desegregating the government, the first five black women walked into the, the gates at Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory. Mm-hmm. And Christine uh, Darden, you were one of these women. What What is your biggest lasting impression that you keep with you about that, 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 that job? Uh, well, the the job that I had, I was a little later than 1943, uh, and we were getting ready to walk on the moon. That was the most exciting thing that was happening when I went to NASA, and I actually went into a computing pool that was that had done all of the tests for the reentry of the Apollo back into the atmosphere, uh, in in the uh, work that I did. So. Um, it, just to learn what they were doing at, at NASA was exciting to me. I didn't really even know what engineers did until I got there and I saw what they were doing. And I was actually, you know, doing work for them and, and understanding a bit what they were doing. Mm-hmm. And, and did, you, did you ever aspire to become an engineer while you were working there? Oh, yes, I did. Um, I, uh, in fact, uh, started to to ask my bosses and everything about going to school, and I ultimately went back and got a Ph.D. in mechanical engineering at George Washington University. Mm-hmm. And uh, how many women were working with you at any one time? I'm trying to picture your your at, your atmosphere there, and I, and I know reading from the book, reading from uh, Margot's book, that uh, back in back in the segregation days. Uh, there was sort of like a dual life you were living. One is one as a computer or an engineer, and then you would go into the cafeteria. And Margot, uh, you talk about this in the book. And then there'd be a segregated area where the the, the women couldn't sit with the with the white people. Yeah, I just um, just to be clear, the the segregated era really lasted um, till the end of the the NACA era. So it really, when the first black women started in 1943. Um, they, you know, they did have segregated bathrooms, they had a segregated cafeteria, and they actually worked in a segregated office, which was called the West Area Computing Office. Um, but when uh, the Russians, um, you know, uh, launched Sputnik in 1957, which really precipitated the change of the NACA to NASA, the space agency that we know today, um, that's really when when the the um, the segregated facilities mm-hmm. came to an end. So, and that happened uh, ten years before um, Dr. Darden got to the mm-hmm. center. Mm-hmm. You you focus on uh, just a few of these women: Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughn, Mary Jackson. What about these women made their stories important to tell in this book? Uh, well, first of all, they, they spent their entire careers um, or, you know, finished their careers, I should say, because they started their careers as math teachers. Um, but they finished their careers at the Langley um, Research Center. So it, it was possible to sort of trace the course of their careers, um, you know, as they fought to get promoted, you know, as NASA started uh, focusing on space, uh, you know, and, and not just aeronautics. Um, so that, you know, that was one of the things. Um, the other thing is, you know, they had some exceptional achievements. Um, you know, uh, in the case of Dorothy Vaughn, you know, what I discovered is that she was actually the first African-American um, manager, supervisor um, of, of any gender um, at, at Langley or at, at NASA, at all of what would become NASA. Um, Mary Jackson was promoted to be an engineer, making her the first uh, black woman to be an engineer at NASA and possibly in the entire United States. Um, you know, Katherine Johnson, she's someone who um, really stood out for um, doing the calculations for the early Mercury missions um, and, and had, you know, a long career, storied career at Langley. Um, you know, and then Dr. Darden came in and stood on the shoulders of, of these women 
and um, made you know superb achievements in the field of supersonic flight and uh, and sonic boom. So. Um, you know, all of those characteristics and then the fact that in so many ways, these women's lives intersected other aspects of, of the 20th century, mm-hmm. including the civil rights movement, um, Brown versus Board of Ed decision. Um, so, you know, the, the, so many aspects of their lives made for good science and good storytelling. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Christine Darden, what are you most proud of having accomplished? What would you say is your single biggest accomplishment at NASA when you were there? Well, my first task when I went, when I was became an engineer was to develop a computer program that would give us uh, insight into how to design an airplane for minimized sonic boom. And I developed that program and spent the next 15 or 20 years actually using that program, designing models, testing them, uh, making changes when we weren't quite right, and uh, ultimately doing flight tests. And hopefully that uh, those th- same theories might be actually demonstrated in an airplane if NASA can get an X-plane for supersonic flight in the next few years. Mm-hmm. And, and how did the political events, I mean, uh, of the times you were there right there in the 60s, there were tremendous political events going 64, 65, the civil rights movement, um, did you feel that shaping your job at all at NASA? Uh, well, of course, I did live through very turbulent times, uh, and I lived through exciting times. Uh, you know, also the Sputnik was mm-hmm. was shot up when I was in high school, also, and so um, I, I think I think one of the I was I had been in an all black environment pretty much until I came to NASA. I, my entire education was uh, segregated, and uh, so when I got there and I started thinking that I really wanted to pursue engineering and work as an engineer and I wanted to go to school, one of the toughest decisions to make was I knew that the others in my class would be six or seven white males, and I would be the only female and the only black, and that that worried me a long time and I finally said I'm going to do it and and I did it and uh, nobody spoke to me for for a while but after the first few weeks and after a test or two a couple of the guys came over and said hey you want to join our study group and so uh, it it moved on from there and I was focusing on doing what I was there to do. Yeah and and Margo it must have been sort of the same kind of um breakthrough for, for uh, Katherine Johnson to be trusted with creating the calculations that first put John Glenn into orbit and brought him back in 1962. Yeah, I mean, this this is a, it's a an almost unbelievable thing. I mean, we have a situation where in Virginia, which is still a segregated state, um, you know, this was a time when not that long before that, Um, Women weren't allowed to serve on juries. A lot of states didn't allow women to get credit cards in their own names. Um, You know, and yet here is Katherine Johnson, a black woman woman working with white male engineers and saying, you know, raising her hand and saying, listen, I'm the one to finish the report that describes the orbital flight, you know, that was upcoming. She did that in 1959. And, um, you know, she was the one that, you know, when when they were counting down to the 1962, February 1962 orbital flight of astronaut John Glenn. um, And, you know, you can imagine the kind of checklists and um, and anxiety around that. You know, this is a very complicated mission that they had. And um, one of the checklist items was having Katherine Johnson um, basically take a, a simulated a set of data that went through the computer, you know, basically simula- simulating the upcoming flight, having Katherine Johnson take the raw numbers and run them through all of the equations that have been programmed in the computer by hand to make wow. sure that the computer's results were the same as her results. So John Glenn, what he actually said was, listen, get the girl to do it. And at that time, all of the women, um, regardless of their age or background, were commonly referred to as the girls. The I've, got, I've got to interrupt to just to, <laughs> just, to, just to remind our stations that uh, this is Science Friday from PRI, Public Radio International. Um, yeah, so John Glenn trusted uh, Katherine Johnson's numbers um, 
you know, as one of the pre-flight checklists, you know, and this, this is, it's an amazing story. Did and, he do um, this, did he do this personally, ask for this? He, I, you know, I've checked so many different sources on that, yeah. for this from Katherine Johnson to, you know, the, the, the uh, engineers and um, even astronauts who have asked, who asked John Glenn in retrospect about that moment. And um, he asked for the girl. You know, and everybody, you know, they knew that she was the particular girl working in that group and that the engineers that were very closely associated with that particular endeavor um, would sort the that particular task over to her. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Christine Darden, how did, how did your work life and your home life compare? Was it easier, uh, you know, to be to be black at NASA or in Hampton, Virginia? Uh, <laughs> probably at NASA at, at the time, because uh, as she told the story about a woman couldn't get a credit card, I tried to buy a violin uh, one year, and they told me my husband had to come in and pay for it. I says he's not paying for it, you know. So the, there we had lots of incidences like that in Hampton. Mm-hmm. And uh, and uh, of course, there's a famous incident, uh, uh, Margo, in your book about taking away the sign at the lunch ca- at the lunchroom there, at the table, the segregation sign. That's true. Now that's something that happened in the very early days. Um, and there was a, a woman named Miriam Mann who worked at Langley until 1967. She was in the very first group. There was uh, a group of 11 women who had gone through a war training class, and five of those um, were the very first women to go and, and take a seat in the West Area Computing Office. And um, those women, they, they were the first black professionals um, at all, all of you know, all of what would become NASA, um, and they, had, you know, they there had been black cafeteria workers and uh, groundskeepers, but they were there yeah. with the engineers. They had a separate table, and Miriam Mann refused. You know, every day she took the sign that said "Colored Computers." on the table. She took it, she put it in her purse, and she took it home, just refusing to <laughs> acknowledge the, the segregation until one day the sign disappeared. And, um, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, it seems like a small thing, yeah. but it really is a great thing for establishing their dignity in that professional workplace. Well, I, want to, I want to thank you both for being uh, with us this hour. Christine Darden, former NASA mathematician engineer. The book is Hidden Figures, and uh, it's out there. Uh, founder of Human Computer Project that... Uh, Charlottesville, Virginia. 